Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be talking about empowering yourself with the subconscious mind. My guest is Friedman Schaub, who is a physician, molecular biologist, researcher, and personal development coach. He is author of The Fear and Anxiety Solution, a breakthrough process for healing and empowerment with your subconscious mind, and The Empowerment Solution, Six Keys to Unlocking Your Full Potential with the Subconscious Mind. Friedman is located in southern France. Now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Friedman. It's a pleasure to have you with us on New Thinking Aloud today. Well, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. You are a physician and a molecular biologist. How did you begin helping people with their subconscious mind? Uh, the short answer is that I was tired of allopathic medicine and I had to definitely look deep inside and realize I have a different purpose than either, you know, just writing prescriptions or doing some uh, experiments on cells or unfortunately also rats. And so there was a moment inside of me that felt like I gained a lot of knowledge. I certainly now understand the body so much better. But there is something missing in the whole picture. And what was missing for me was how can we have trillions of cells doing all their job, all kind of, you know, harmoniously living together, knowing their place, even committing suicide because they have to make room for other cells, which was kind of what I really focusing my research on this phenomenon called apoptosis, how is this all working so beautifully on its own? There must be some consciousness, there must be some wisdom, there must be something inside of us that is like the overarching, over-governing uh, mind that really keeps that all together. Um, and since it's not our intellect, I mean, we cannot even intellectually raise our arms <laughs> we have to really let something else do that we can have a command but then all the fine details are done by another aspect of our mind and this is how i got interested in the subconscious and this is how this journey began you yourself experienced anxiety and symptoms of uh perhaps trauma I believe you described having OCD in your book. Is that Did that also bring you into this interest in researching and understanding this more? For sure. I mean, anxiety was a, a companion for me for many years. And it was definitely something I suffered from. But I wasn't necessarily believing that there is a way out. It was more like the, okay, this is what I have to live with. Like, many people who have anxiety and the OCD was the feeble attempt to somehow gain control in an otherwise seemingly uncontrollable world. I mean, for me, my parents were constantly fighting. My, uh, my sister had troubles in school. I was supposed to be the peacemaker. And then there was also looming world war three happening. So it was a lot. And, uh, and I just had this uh, idea to somehow force destiny to keep my parents alive and prevent this war from happening by straightening carpets. So I was going through the house, straightening all the carpets possible with the idea of, you know, a 10 year old that this may actually do the trick. Plus I had other OCD behavior, but you know, I realized eventually that this anxiety doesn't go anywhere. It's just going to shift and shape itself in different ways. And so it wasn't until I was in cardiology that I said, well, look, I'm not alone. There are so many anxious people here. And most people are my patients that have either strokes or heart attacks or arrhythmia. 
why does no one help them with their anxiety? And how has this anxiety something to do with what they are physically dealing with? My boss at that time totally disputed this. I mean, he said there is no evidence that stress or anxiety has any cause on the physical body. Well, this is in the meantime, again, reverse this idea. Of course, there is a mind-body connection. And of course, stress can affect the body. But it was something that I really missed. I missed this sitting down and understanding people more deeply and not just listening to their hearts or looking at the EKG, but really understanding more why is your heart struggling. And that's how then eventually this whole arch came back to helping people to overcome anxiety. Right. So you were helping them with their thoughts, their emotions, their beliefs, and or you wanted to, <laughs> and that's what's led you into uh, helping people more with their subconscious mind? Well, I think the subconscious was my entry and my exit point from allopathic medicine. For, you know, at least two years in research, once I had my PhD, I was thinking, okay, I need to do something that really fulfills me. Of course, I can stay in research, but that's not really, you know, where I think my purpose is. And it wasn't until I had a friend telling me about uh, the subconscious mind and the methods he learned in in a training that I really got curious about it. And you know, I didn't know so much about the subconscious mind, but as soon as I heard the word, something inside of me was ringing a bell. And then I read up on it and I got curious about it. And I did countless trainings about how to work with the subconscious. And I do see it as a major underutilized key for us to live more healthy, balanced and fulfilled lives. I think we are so focused on our heads that we really forget that more subconscious, heart-centered way of being. And, and that's, I would say, is my mission to help people to become more in touch with that deeper inner resource of the subconscious, which is I believe, actually superior to the conscious mind. How would you define the subconscious in contrast or comparison to the conscious mind? I mean, you can define it by its job. You know, the subconscious job is very different from the conscious mind. The conscious mind is the intellect, it's the rational thinking, it's the planning, it's ultimately all that what we rely on during the day. Now, this is a very unemotional place. It's much more about logic. The subconscious is the illogical part of the mind, the deeper part of the mind. That's why it's called subconscious. And it is responsible for emotions, the memories that we store inside. There are countless memories and often we don't even remember them until something gets triggered and something comes up and that was stored in the subconscious. As I mentioned before, the mind-body connection is largely controlled by the subconscious, our deep core values and beliefs, and certainly the automatic patterns of everyday living. I mean, you know, when we think about, you know, eating while watching a movie or, uh, you know, shaving while thinking about work, how come that we survive these things? Well, the subconscious makes sure that we are not getting hurt and not stabbing our eyes with a fork while we're eating because it knows what it needs to do, which is ultimately to protect us. And the conscious mind goes off on a tangent and thinks about all the things that are kind of unnecessary because you're usually in the future or the past, while the subconscious is you know, waking over us and making sure we get out of it unharmed. And that sounds beautiful. The subconscious is like a, a super nanny, but it has some flaws. The subconscious mind can assist us in our lives throughout our days and sleeping and resting. And it also can harbor past memories or events that might be unhelpful that can in effect, limit us in our lives? Well, I wouldn't say that this is limiting us. Uh, what, you know, the, the memories, for example, 
that the subconscious often blocks or puts into, you know, so to speak, big black bags just to protect us from traumas or things that we are not ready to face. That's another protective function of the subconscious. I mean, a lot of people have their first memory of child abuse spontaneously, you know, during a acupuncture treatment or a massage, and then all of a sudden they crystal clear see what happened. The subconscious is just waiting until we are at the place where we can actually deal with what happened to us. The subconscious doesn't want to hold us back. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, emotions are so useless at times. Let's take anxiety. Well, I want to go on a date and I'm shaking or I'm, you know, not knowing how to be funny anymore because I'm so worried that I'm not like, that's a useless emotion, they would say. But in the end, that anxiety is designed to protect you. And this, 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 let's say, owner's manual of the subconscious that says you need to be protected this way is a very old one. That is where the subconscious Ill really gets the idea of how we are supposed to go through life in order to get out alive. Because when the conscious mind is very underdeveloped, when we really don't have a lot of clue on how to feed ourselves, protect ourselves, you know, be the ones that ultimately, you know, are able to take care of ourselves, when we are really dependent on others, the subconscious looks and takes notes. And if there are rejections, if there is neglect, if there is hurt, if there is chaos, and it doesn't even have to be super traumatic, just something that is startling this inner protector of us. It says, okay, let's see, how can we avoid this? How can we make sure that you're safe? And one way to be safe is anxiety. Anything that potentially can cause further harm, the subconscious notices and says, alert, alert, alert. And of course, when we are still operating from the mindset of a child, we are feeling like children when the anxiety gets triggered, which is why when someone criticizes us and we still run these old ideas of criticism needs to be uh, avoided, we shrink. When we feel shy, um, even though maybe at work we feel very powerful, but in social settings we feel like the little 12-year-old wallflower we've always been standing in the corner not talking to anyone, again, we revert back. So as soon as the subconscious says, you're not safe, I'll take over, we often feel small, we feel like children, we feel powerless. And that is interpreted as something useless. But in the end, it is simply that what I mentioned before, the flaw of the subconscious, it does the same thing over and over again until we are showing the subconscious, hmm, let's rewrite the owner's manual. Let's get a little update here. Well, thank you for the new PR on the subconscious that it is really about helping to protect us and keep us safe. So in your own life, when you were experiencing this, these anxiety patterns, what helped you feel more safe without needing to have those patterns that were causing you distress? Well, I think, you know, it's a journey, of course, and I didn't know what I know now. And I wish I would have my books already to read when I was dealing with anxiety. Now, as I said, my anxiety was morphing and there were two patterns that I had. One was the achiever pattern. And that pattern is not really described uh, per se. It's like a form of a pleaser pattern because I believed only if I'm an overachiever, only if I'm the best, only if I can always show something I have done, I deserve to be loved. I deserve to have approval. And that had a lot of reference from the past. The other pattern was the avoider pattern. And the avoider pattern was that I didn't want to show my feelings. I didn't want to show my vulnerability. I was nicely comfortable in the white coat and the stethoscope or hiding behind my intellect, but no one really knew who I was. And these two patterns made me feel very lost. And, you know, I had panic attacks 
which was all about, you know, do I really want to do this job for another 25 years, in this case, medicine. But I also had this feeling of complete emptiness, this feeling of who am I? I don't even know who I am. I don't even know how it is to feel comfortable in your own skin. And and for me, the journey began through finding yoga. It was really through kundalini yoga of all things, because that was the only yoga I had time for to go. And something happened when I closed my eyes during these whole, you know, the, the kriyas, the, the motions and, uh, there was an introspection that I didn't really allow myself to have before. And, and through the yoga and through the meditation, I realized I need to identify myself through me and not through my accomplishments or not through what other people think of me or what they reflect back on me. I have to find out who I am. And that took a long time. So the beauty about this book is that it gives you a shortcut how to get there much faster because it's a very specific step-by-step -step process. But it is ultimately, no matter what you do, the journey to yourself that the anxiety is inviting you to take on. So this is why, and I just want to quickly say this, I roll my eyes and it's not out of, you know, lack of compassion. When I hear you know, people that want to be helpful with anxiety saying, oh, you're a poor thing and it's so hard and I know and it's just like you have to just keep going. And and that's such a demonizing of the anxiety. And I feel anxiety has much bigger purpose than that. It is not here to torture us or make our life bad. It's It's usually not any kind of illness. It is something that we just have to learn to understand. And without the anxiety that I was struggling with, you and I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't be on this path. I would be in Germany in cardiology, helping people with heart attacks and probably having my own because I was not really living what I was supposed to live. So the anxiety woke me up and sent me on the search to myself and if we can see the anxiety as such we can actually embrace it more and not just run it run away from it or fight it yeah anxiety can serve a purpose and let a person know that there's something that wants attention or that maybe isn't uh, right in their lives absolutely and i think that's a really important thing that we really see the anxiety not just something about oh what's going outside of us wrong what's happening there but really saying what is it what i'm doing to myself that creates the anxiety and this is where you know the survival patterns come in so my avoider survival pattern for example made me more anxious it was designed to say well don't show what you feel because when you show what you feel, people criticize you for it or people make you feel bad for it and or will take advantage for it. So have this nice little, you know, empowered demeanor and just keep it all for yourself. But what I noticed is just that I became more and more worried, more and more afraid of this kind of rejection or criticism because my safety was not in my own hands. It was dependent on how people see me. Same thing with the pleaser pattern. If you are a pleaser and if you are an achiever, you know, you can do whatever you want. You can be, you know, super successful or Mother Teresa. The good feeling only lasts as long as someone says, great. Wow. I admire you. This is amazing. And as soon as you leave the room, the good feeling is gone. It's like heating a house with a match one after another and nothing really keeps longer inside of you that, that gives you a sense of, yeah, I am a good person or yes, this is really my identity to, you know, to give and make a difference. So what I'm saying is that when we are in these survival patterns, even though they are well meant, the dependency on others, either to please them or to avoid them, creates actually more anxiety than it is eventually healing the anxiety. And that's why we have to turn this around. 
for you growing up, you describe in your book how you were a peacemaker in the family because of your environment. And I think so many people grow up in homes where there is lack of attention. I mean, some people do grow up in very loving homes. I think that that may be more the exception than the rule. And what did you discover within yourself around your upbringing that helped you to heal more from experiencing this distress and to be able to come to know your own authentic self more? Well, you know, of course, we can always say everyone just does their best. And often when parents are not really able to nourish or comfort or be available emotionally as we want them to, it usually has to do also with their upbringing. And, and I think forgiveness and realizing, okay, let's look into their childhood and see that, you know, my father was in World War II when he was just 17 years old. And my mother had to flee when she was just 12 years old because of World War II. So they had really tough, tough childhood. And, and I saw that they also never really had received enough nourishment and enough comfort. So it's difficult to give something that you actually don't know what it looks like and that you haven't really experienced yourself. And that helped me a lot. But I also realized that there is something about knowing that you're missing something and then taking responsibility for it rather than hoping that somebody else is going to do it for you. That's incredibly empowering. You know, one of the, the patterns I describe in the book is the lover pattern. And the lover pattern is classic for people that haven't received enough love. It's often when there you know, was a divorce and one parent just cut the family off and disappeared, or when there was a constant rejection of a parent and, and you always wondered, am I lovable? Am I really good enough? Is there something wrong with you? with me and then you go out there and you look for a romantic partner and you hope that this partner is going to fill this void or heal this wound and it never really works out great because you're so codependent and you're so suspicious either the partner is really nice and you wonder what's wrong with this person because i deserve only to be treated badly or the partner treats you exactly as badly as you were treated as a child so you're re-traumatizing yourself so it doesn't really work out well. And so realizing that the first goal is to take responsibility for whatever was missing and for whatever was broken inside of us, I find that maybe the harder path, but a much more gratifying, fulfilling one, and certainly a more empowering one. You describe six survival patterns in your book, and the first one is the victim. And that's what you just mentioned is being able to reclaim your own power with that self responsibility. Certainly, we can blame our parents or blame our partners or teachers. But ultimately, and certainly people have had, you know, horrific things happen to them, for sure. And at the same time, you're suggesting that how our worldview is, we can work with that through the subconscious mind to heal our memories and beliefs associated with being, for example, a victim, which is the first type you have here? Well, the victim is certainly something that I think is very misunderstood. Because, I mean, what I really see in my clientele is that the ones that had the most horrific childhood where you just you know almost cannot stand listening to what happened to them that they are often the ones that are taking the most responsibility that they are the ones that say you know what i cannot change what happened but i want to heal and i want to move forward and so even though they have all the reasons to feel victimized and being the victim for life there is a deep desire to prove to themselves no this person or this family, they didn't, uh, you know, extinguish my light. They didn't break my spine. They did not annihilate my identity. So they don't necessarily know how to heal, but they are determined. 
And I think the people that often are not really having the same experience, they are almost more comfortable in being in the victim role because it kind of sets you free. You know, when you're really living in victimhood, you can say, well, you know, I'm a survivor and that's enough. And I don't have to necessarily improve because look at everything that happened to me. And that is a pattern that is hard sometimes for us to, to see in ourselves, but it's really important to address. You know, this is where we are keeping people at arm's length because we're saying, oh, the past repeats itself and I'm going to get hurt again. So why should I? Or it's where we are always finding perpetrators. So we are in this poor me mode. And then at some point, friends and family say, you know, but what about looking for a therapist or a coach? And then you get angry at these people because how dare them, you know, not really take your pain serious. I mean, we all had these moments where we felt so sorry for ourselves that we didn't really want to get out of it for many reasons. And one reason may be that not having to change feels safer than daring to change and daring to take responsibility. But ultimately, it's where we get stuck. And I feel that getting stuck in a comfort zone is the worst that we can do for ourselves. You know, this is being in a place where we feel safe and everything is predictable and nothing can happen to us. But at the end, we will have to face one thing that's worse than anything we were afraid of, which is regret. Regret that we never lived a better and bigger life. I hear what you're saying. And there are times where people have so much pain that they even attempt to take their own lives. And sometimes they are successful in that endeavor. Absolutely. And I really feel like, you know, this is not to be said that you never should feel that pain and honor that you were a victim and that you are feeling helpless and that you're feeling powerless. I think that's really important. I think it's, it's actually dangerous when we are kind of skipping across what happened to us and just saying, Oh, it's in the past. I don't want to think about it. And, and then it actually haunts us subconsciously. But I also feel like that we haven't really been taught what it means to take responsibility. And taking responsibility doesn't mean that we are taking blame or that we are saying, well, somehow it must be my fault. Taking responsibility is simply asking exactly the questions that these clients I just told you about are asking, what is it in me that is now the resource that I know this person or this, you know, situation that I was in? did not destroy, did not get to? How can I see myself actually as the one who is growing beyond what happened to me to show myself that I'm not defined by what happened, but that I'm defining myself through how I respond to it? And that is where we just sometimes need help to learn from the past, to find ourselves again, to also cast away the shadow that was unfortunately put upon us. I mean, one of the big, you know, uh, ideas about taking responsibilities to see that everyone in our lives, no matter how good or bad they were, ultimately are teachers for us. And uh, at the same time, we are teachers for them. We can always learn. And from the people that treated us the worst, we can learn often the most. And when I think back at when I felt victimized, especially in my childhood, when I felt like, well, I was supposed to be the mediator, the peacemaker, everyone else was just fighting or avoiding each other. And I had to go back and forth, like between two war fronts and, you know, give messages. That's too much for an eight year old. But at the same time, taking responsibility made me realize, you know, this set me up for doing the work I'm doing now. I can put myself into anybody's shoes because I learned early on to always see things from different perspectives without getting stuck in it. There is a fluidity that I'm really grateful for that I have gained during this time. And I found that very healing. Your name, Friedman, actually means man of peace. That's right. Yes. And that was by design. 
I would have been a Frederike as a girl, but uh, Man of Peace was even better because I was designed as a second child to save the family. So it was the idea, let's make him the peacemaker. And, you know, it worked. They stayed together, my parents, and uh, I think it was for the better, even though it was at times really tough for them. But I think, you know, we have to sometimes see also that, well, on some level, we have chosen to come together. I do believe there is a soul choice, and I think these were the perfect parents for me. I was the perfect uh, peacemaker for them, and and that gives me personally peace to see it this way. It doesn't necessarily mean that your parents are off the hook completely for <laughs> how you were raised. Well, I forgave them by simply realizing also that holding on to, you know, whatever they did or didn't do is not really serving me. And the worst thing we can do, and my parents now have passed, but the worst thing we can do is to hold ourselves back from growing beyond what we experience because we want the ones that did something wrong to apologize or make up for it. Or we want to at least prove to them, see, I'm so messed up because you did this to me. And that's subconscious again. That's a part of the victim pattern. But it's a very dangerous one because it again puts the power into other people's hands rather than claiming it yourself. You describe six survival patterns in your book. And we've been discussing the first one that you describe the victim. Then there is the invisible pattern, the procrastinator, the chameleon, the helper, and the lover. And these seem to be archetypal patterns. And you shared that these are patterns that you discovered over and over when working with your clients. Yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's actually originally there were 12 patterns that just came to me as clear as day when I was on a hike. And it was just, you know, sometimes these things happen. You just know, okay, this is what actually makes people still stumble after all the times that they have been struggling and then healing their anxiety and their in insecurity. Why does it come back? Why are people sometimes recreating that what they have just resolved and and the patterns became just clear as that what we are overlooking it's like you know let's say you you would have a car accident and you would heal from the car accident and you would really feel like, okay now the wounds are closed i can walk again all is good you go back in the car and you have another accident well what happened well what happened is that you're a miserable driver you never really learned how to drive this car in a safe way. And so you repeat the accident. And that's what we sometimes do too. You know, the, the symptom of the pain of anxiety is just that. It's a symptom. It's a message. But how we create it is not only the past. It's also how we repeat the patterns from the past in the present time. And that's those patterns that really ultimately make us still identify with a limited version of ourselves and not with the empowered leader of our lives. And, and those 12 patterns, I condensed them down to six because it was just too much for a book. So there will be a second book about the other six patterns at some point. But uh, it's these six that I thought or felt if I would tally it down those are the ones that really most of us are struggling with. Not only people with anxiety, but in general, we do get stuck in these patterns. So this is not a book about let's get rid of anxiety. This is a book about let's get more empowered because I think we all can use that. Yes, definitely. And it makes me think of the Enneagram where there are certain patterns where a person has a particular archetype, if you will, that seems to be perhaps innate, well, is innate to their personality, who they are, and it can have strengths and, shall we say, weaknesses. And it also makes me think of astrology in that if you look at a person's natal chart, if they know down to the minute when they were born, there's often patterns and 
really in the cosmos, if you will, of, of how a person might be created or maybe even their sole purpose of what they're doing here. Definitely. I mean, unlike, uh, you know, astrology, we certainly can change our patterns. But yes, there is a tendency that maybe some kind of, uh, you know, uh, characteristics that we are born with. I certainly am a very sensitive and a very generous and giving person. So it makes sense that I become a helper and a pleaser and a, and a peacemaker. And then others are using their sensitivity much more to become invisible because they're scanning the room and always looking for anything that's dangerous. And so they are shrinking. So that is definitely something where you would say it is uh, dependent also on their, you know, whatever, DNA, their soul, their astrology. But what I find interesting is that none of these patterns are, you know, designed to overrule our life. We don't have to live in those patterns and, and that we do carry those patterns really inside of us. You know, I often talk to overachievers because, yeah, overachievers are also pretty anxious and, uh, and stressed. And they are at the beginning completely I don't know, almost like offended when I tell them that they are procrastinators. I'm not a procrastinator. I'm always busy. I'm always doing something. Being productive is the most important value I have. But then they realize, well, I have been procrastinating a long time around self-care, around having friendships or improving my relationship or even having a relationship with my children or, you know, healing my relationship with my parents or anything that made them feel uncomfortable and out of control, which is overachievers feel or need control. They love to see okay, I'm going to put this amount of energy in, I'm going to get that amount of energy, money or whatever success back. Anything that feels like much more intangible is what they avoid. And that is a form of procrastination. And so we can find these patterns in all of us. And what those patterns do are they are poking little holes into our sense of self. They just don't allow us to thrive as much because we are not living a well-rounded life. We are living a little bit of wobbly life because we are heavily relying on one aspect and kind of ignoring other aspects. And in the subconscious mind, we also can access our own intuition and our own inner knowing and really a sense of deep love. Yes. And that is where I think, you know, my journey through yoga and meditation made me realize that there is actually a huge source of love inside of me that I always felt like was pretty much only there for others. But realizing that I can actually also claim this source of love for myself, that was like a whole new perspective. And, and that is where the subconscious is such a, you know, such a beautiful, powerful healer because in order to love yourself, you don't really have to have any logic or reason. You can simply love yourself because. And there is a journey in uh, the book. A lot of the, the processes in the book are actually conscious, subconscious collaboration. That means like you're working consciously with the subconscious mind. But there is a process that leads you back to your essence. And back to your essence basically means like, going back to who you are before you had any kind of uh, ideas, identities, programmings, personalities. You're just getting back in touch with your authentic truth. And that is such a powerful place to be because you can love, accept, appreciate, and believe in that truth because it's ultimately who you are without any need to be even to describe it or define it. There's just a, it's like you were floating around in space and all of a sudden you found gravity and it pulls you back inside and pulls you back to yourself. That is when my anxiety disappeared. That when I found this hold in myself, all changed and all my perspective on myself and the world changed. You describe a process in your book called disentanglement. 
Can you share a little summary about how that might help someone who's listening to us now? The disentanglement process is a process that is about the, the victim pattern, but it is actually something we can use all the time because we may find ourselves stuck. And what I noticed often is that we are in, you know, situations or relationships that disempower us. And even though we don't necessarily, you know, want to think about those people or give them power. Subconsciously, there is still almost like a, a differential in size. They are big and they have, you know, all the control and we feel small. And in the disentanglement process, you're turning it around. And, and I talked before about teacher and student paradigm and, and you really start a, you made a decision to say, okay, I'm going to let go of this relationship the way it used to be through forgiving, meaning like I'm giving back anything that doesn't serve me anymore. And B, I'm seeing this person or the situation as a real growth opportunity. And I'm asking my subconscious to help me to learn from it, to grow from it. Also, I ask my subconscious to tell me what was I supposed to teach this person, no matter if this person was actually getting the lesson or not. And then through a process of compassion and releasing all those uh, beliefs and emotions that you have taken on or that you have harbored inside through letting go of the you owe me, the debt sheet that we often have against others, you are showing the subconscious that you're complete, that you're disentangled. And I did this process with my parents before they died, about 10, 15 years before they died. And it really, really changed my relationships because what changed for me is that I had no longer any expectations. I didn't need them to be different. I didn't need our Sunday call to be all about why don't they ask me any questions? Why don't they never go deep? Why is it always on the surface? Why do they always talk about their life? All of those questions I didn't need to ask anymore because I could just accept them for who they were. And that was a big, big gift for me. And I think for them, because we had these, you know, last years in great harmony. And I think if we can get to this point without expectations and realize, well, it's up to me to get from other relationships, the depth or, you know, the sharing that I don't get from the people I always hoped I would get it from that sets us free. Mm -hmm. Well, it's wonderful that you were able to make peace with your relationship with your parents. For those who may be listening and thinking, this is, I have so much wounds or so many wounds, so much trauma, where would you suggest they begin or how can you encourage them with their own healing? I really think we are doing ourselves a disfavor when we are defining ourselves with our trauma. Because I think that is like where people define themselves with anxiety. It's like, I am anxious. I have anxiety. And we're not looking left and right. We are not looking anywhere what actually is so much more about ourselves. It's a, you know, the physical analogy is when you have a broken toe and all you can really focus on is the pain in the toe, even though 95% or more of your body are totally fine. You don't feel it. You don't see it because you're pulled into that. So I think what we need to do is to step a little bit back and realize that the trauma is only an episode in our time and in our lives. And it did certainly cause a lot of confusion. It caused a lot of pain. It caused, caused a lot of probably dismay and anxiety. But from a subconscious perspective, all those things are just pointing towards there is something unresolved. People that have trauma hold on to the trauma, not because the trauma is so fun to really cuddle and, and you know, get attached to. They hold on to the trauma because the subconscious says, you know, I have a lot of questions about this. 
And I have to resolve those questions. It's this confusion that I just mentioned that we have to resolve. Why did this happen to me? Why did this person do this? What does it say about the rest of me and the rest of my life? And, and in a, you know, deeper process, you can answer those questions and you can find resolution and you can realize that the pain can release because you are literally finding these answers and you're finding a place where all this makes sense in your life. It's not desirable. It's not what you would have necessarily consciously chosen, but you can find acceptance. And from there, you can find a way forward. So don't just look at the pain. See the pain also as the confusion that needs to be addressed and resolved, and you will get answers. Because a person can have beliefs about themselves based on emotions they experienced from that trauma. And, and you help people and why we're having this conversation is to help people recognize that they can replace those beliefs with new ones. Yes. And beliefs are really what ultimately, you know, shapes how we see ourselves in the world. It's not just the emotions. It's really, the belief that have been, the beliefs that have been created because of the emotions. So, for example, when someone was traumatized, you know, let's say it didn't only happen once, it happened several or multiple times. There is a belief that may say that you're not safe in the world or that no one can be trusted or that the shoe gonna drop again or that there is something wrong with you, that you're not supposed to be here, that you don't belong here. And that is a huge subconscious filter. That means you will not see the world for all its possibilities. You will not see yourself for your truth. All you see is through the filters of that belief. And so as soon as someone raises an eyebrow at you, you feel attacked. As soon as you feel like, you know, there is just anything unpredictable, you get into a panic because you believe you're not safe is much stronger than it needs to be. And so the goal is for you to update your belief system. And that's what I mean with rewriting the owner's manual and to realize these beliefs make sense because this is what happened to me in the past, but I'm not that person anymore. I'm older. I have certainly learned a lot. I have grown a lot. I have a lot of resources. I have a lot of support. The world that I lived in was predominantly maybe benevolent or actually supportive. But what I'm holding on to are these traumatizing events that shaped this belief system. So I have to put this all back into a new perspective and really decide what serves me more to hold on to the, you know, self-protective traumatized belief system or to choose a belief system that gives me a chance to live with greater joy and purpose. Friedman, is there anything else you want to share today about empowering yourself with the subconscious mind? Well, I think it's a, a beautiful journey to have to get to know that there is an inner ally inside of us that we don't actually know so well. Most people don't really have a close relationship with their subconscious. They know it exists. They sometimes don't like it or they blame it for nightmares or some bad behaviors, but they don't really know what the subconscious really can do for them and the wisdom that the subconscious has. So just being curious and Stopping to distract ourselves from the, you know, all these outside noises and everything that just leads us in all different kinds of directions and leaves us more and more confused to turn inwards and really just learn to know the story that the subconscious can tell you about your past, about your truth, about the dreams and desires that you have forgotten, but that they were there. That's how you you know, really were born, and certainly also the information about your greater purpose. Once we connect to our truth and our subconscious and we are in alignment, we don't get distracted anymore. We don't get, you know, swayed by some 
loud, fear-mongering, disturbing, you know, voices on the outside. We know who we are. We know what we believe in. And I think we can be of greater service to each other. This is not a journey just for self-fulfillment. This is a journey also for the earth, for the planet. If we are not learning to understand each other, love and appreciate each other, I think we are in trouble. And so the journey starts here within our hearts. And that is where I think the hope for a better future can be individually and also globally. What a beautiful vision. And thank you so much for helping us all to make our subconscious more conscious and have more harmony and peace within and with all of us in the world. Thank you so much for being with me today, Friedman. Well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about something I'm so passionate about. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death?